Okay, Julie. Thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Dante. Uh, and uh, before we start, we, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the programs and the services that Carrie, um, Carrie Kind offers. Very briefly, and we'll uh, move on to um, our, our presenter. Uh, so one of the many programs that we have uh, at Caring Kind are the educational seminars, some of these monthly educational seminars. We also have, um, we will have uh, educational family caregiver workshops. And these workshops help family and friends understand, navigate the challenges of People need uh, that. And, and if you could just please mute yourself, that would be great. Uh, we uh, we oh, have oh, professional. Muted? Okay. Yeah, it's, it should be muted. Make sure it's muted. Do you hear people? I hear you for that. Okay. okay. Uh... Hi, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so the the um, the other uh, programs that we have are also for professionals. We have professional education that offer CEUs. We have early stage programs for people with uh, mild cognitive impairment uh, or early stage Alzheimer's or dementia. We have support groups for family members uh, and the support groups are pretty much to have a, an environment, a safe place to express your emotions, talk to other people and share your feelings in a safe, non-judgmental environment. Um, we have a program called Medic Alert, uh, New York City Wonder Safety Program. It's a 24 hour nationwide emergency response service in case someone gets lost. Uh, the, we also have Connect to Culture, which creates a unique opportunity to stimulate conversations through music, through art and dance. The diversity outreach we have, um, which provides outreach in various communities uh, are also available. Uh, we have uh, different uh, uh, projects that are coming up. One specific project that started is a one-to-one -one, uh, coaching program, and that's for family members that are struggling with caregiving. Uh, and if you are interested in any of these programs or want more details about them, you could call our helpline. You can email us at, uh, uh, at our um, email, and I'll put all of that information later or you could go on our website. The helpline number is 646-744-2900. Uh, so moving forward, I'm going to uh, start with the program and um, it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Luchtinger, who is an associate professor of medicine and epidemiology at Columbia University. He is a general internist. He has conducted research and clinical practice in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia since 1999. His area of interest include Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia risk factors, caregiving and diagnosis. His research portfolio in Alzheimer's and related dementia have been funded by the Alzheimer's Association, the Quarry, and the National Institute of Health. So please welcome me in joining, in, in welcoming Dr. Lou Singer, uh, who is gonna be talking to us uh, about mild cognitive, impair, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, and the research opportunities that are available. Dr. Lutzinger, I'll leave it in. Hi, uh, anyhow, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I have a long relationship with uh, Dante. I think we worked together for about seven years or something like that. Uh, it was for a long time. 
And, uh, and also I have a longstanding relationship with Caring Kind uh, since it was the New York City chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. Uh, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with them. Uh, and so anyway, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and be part of uh, an activity of, of caring kind. So anyhow, I, this is just going to be like a informal conversation at the end of the day, uh, nothing heavy. I don't have slides. I don't have any, uh, um, any, any, um, you know, formal presentation, but what I intend to do is to, you know, give you a summary of uh, the current state of things in Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia in general, as I see it. And what I'll do is, you know, I'll speak for a little while, uh, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then open up the, the session for, for questions of any type that you want. Uh, we may not we may not occupy the full two hours, but I, I think that it's going to be uh, pretty comprehensive. So I'll I'll start with uh, answering one question that I always get, uh, which is you know what what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia, which people get very confused about. Okay, and so dementia means that a person has cognitive impairment, usually memory problems, uh, but along with other things such as attention problems, that, uh, that is severe enough to interfere with their capacity to live independently. So in other words, a person with dementia, what it means is that there's a, a level of cognitive or mental impairment that's high enough so that a person cannot live independently and needs help from, other, from others. This does not include physical issues. This is just due to uh, mental issues, okay? So, uh, and we believe that the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And what Alzheimer's disease means is that there's the presence in the brain of high levels of particularly a bad protein called amyloid, uh, but also of another protein that's related to amyloid that is called tau. But at least in, in terms of the current state of science, if you are going to be, uh, if, if a person is said to have Alzheimer's disease is because they have high amyloid in the brain. What has happened is that for, for many, many years or decades, actually, the, the, fee, the main feature of Alzheimer's disease, which was memory loss, was you know, extended to, all, you know, to most dementias, okay? And so at some point in the last 30 years, uh, and this is both, uh, this is the fault of, I guess, clinicians in part, in part you know, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia were used as synonyms, okay? But actually there's people who are very picky about this and they call dementia the clinical syndrome, meaning the, the symptoms that I, that, I, that I just talked about, and they call Alzheimer's only the findings in the brain. And so they say, well, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. But unfortunately in practice, we say, oh, that person has Alzheimer's. And it, it refers that that person has dementia that's presumably due to these bad proteins in the brain, unless you've done testing uh, to prove it. But anyhow, so Alzheimer's is thought to be the main cause of dementia uh, in around 70% of people, though this varies depending on who you talk to and, uh, um, uh, and, and what studies you look at. And so what, other, the, what are the other causes of dementia, the other 30%? Uh, so the most common second cause, I would say, is what's called vascular dementia, which is called by strokes, you know, either strokes that are symptomatic. So for example, somebody has paralysis of one arm or cannot speak, you know, the classical symptoms of stroke, which is there's paralysis of speech or paralysis of an arm or a leg or all of the above or strokes that are quote unquote silent because they don't cause paralysis, 
but if you do a scan of the brain, you can see the strokes in the brain. So that's the second uh, most most important cause. And you know, it probably occurs in about 20% of people, although increasingly in the last 10 years, there's been a recognition that there's a lot of overlap between Alzheimer's and, and vascular dementia. So a lot of people who have amyloid in the brain also have strokes in the brain, what we call infarcts. And, uh, and, and you know, I think it makes sense that if you have two bad things, is worse than having just one bad thing. And so if you have two bad things, you need less of the two bad things together to, to develop, you know, dementia. Again, dementia means, you know, a cognitive impairment to the level where you cannot function independently anymore. So other causes that are important are Lewy body disease, although it, this is a little bit I don't have to say controversial, but it's an evolving uh, area. So Lewy body disease is characterized by uh, the finding of what's called Lewy bodies in the brain. Uh, in other words, something that you can see on autopsy and on pathology, but it has a very distinctive uh, clinical presentation, which is usually uh, with confusion and waxing and waning uh, cognition, and the other two are hallucinations and what we call extrapyramidal signs, which is like Parkinson's disease, you know, tremor and rigidity, okay? And a famous case of that was that of Robin Williams, okay, who you may have read, uh, I believe he committed suicide, but this was preceded by, by Lewy body dementia. So independent of whether there's those symptoms, there's the thought that actually Lewy bodies so in other words, the, 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 what you find in the brain coexists with the amyloid and other pathologies in many cases. There's another type of dementia called frontotemporal dementias, which are important, but you know, happen in less than 5% of, of people. And uh, it, it, the main feature of these dementias is that they, 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 the, their earliest uh, manifestation is actually behavioral. So it's a change in personality. People either become more aggressive or more withdrawn. They, they have inappropriate sexual behavior, things of that sort. And that appears uh, before or is more prominent than the memory loss and things like that, okay? Uh, and many times uh, the, this, uh, the frontotemporal dementias have a heavy uh, uh, genetic component and they, they occur in families. So those are the main types of dementias. There's other dementias that are, are more rare and I, I won't be speaking about that, but I think by in, la by lar in, large, uh, in large part, the ones that most of us are concerned about are dementia due to Alzheimer's disease and dementia and vascular dementia. Those are the ones that most of us are really at risk for. So, uh, so another question that very often appears is whether uh, you know uh, dementias are inherited. You know whether there's a genetic component, and that's a really good question. So, about five percent of cases of Alzheimer's disease are due to what's called familial Alzheimer's disease. And they are clearly caused by mutations in three particular genes. Uh, what mutation means is that there's a change in a gene that increases your risk of having that particular uh, uh, disease, in this case, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there's, there's three particular uh, genes that can be affected. One is called presenilin-1, the other one is presenilin-2, the other one is amyloid precursor protein. The most common one to be as, uh, uh, affected is presenilin-1. And if you get the bad mutation, meaning the bad change uh, that, that, uh, that causes Alzheimer's disease in these people, and you carry that gene, then people are doomed to get Alzheimer's disease. They, they have what's called full penetrance. They have a 100% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So uh, that's unfortunate for those people, but from a public health perspective, fortunately, 
that happens in less than 5% of cases of Alzheimer's disease, okay? And it usually happens uh, in, in families uh, and even in, in population clusters where, where there's intermingling with families, I guess, uh, where, where there's a consanguinity. So, so for example, in Colombia, there's a very, there's a population of, of, uh, of that is at high risk of, uh, of this familial Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and it's because there, there's been uh, a lot of uh, marrying within, within the family, okay, amongst cousin, first degree cousins, et cetera. Now, this Alzheimer's disease occurs very early. It can occur in people in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. And, you know, if someone has a clear history of the, this in their families, and they get tested and they have the bad mutation, you know, they're, they're, they're going to get the disease. Okay. And there's clinical trials uh, in people who are at risk for this, trying to stop uh, the Alzheimer's disease from, from starting. Okay. But again, this is not what most of us are at risk for. So the, the other 95% of Alzheimer's disease is what we call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And it usually occurs in people uh, above the age of 65 and actually, you know, certainly above 70 with much higher risk in, in the ninth and 10th and, and decades of life, meaning in their 80s and 90s. Uh, and, you know, the risk of this dementia is about 1% in people over the age of 65. And in, then it doubles like every few years, okay, such that depending on what you read, people in their 80s uh, could have a 30% chance of having uh, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. But you know, again, this is uh, debatable. Different studies will show uh, different things. So does this kind of dementia have a genetic component? Yes, it does. It's not completely understood, uh, but the difference between the genetic component in the sporadic Alzheimer's disease and the familial Alzheimer's disease is that while in familial Alzheimer's disease, if somebody has a bad mutation, they're doomed to get Alzheimer's, they get, they're doomed to get dementia. In the sporadic Alzheimer's disease, that's not, not necessarily the case, okay? You can have a bad gene, but not necessarily, you have a higher risk, but you're not doomed to get the dementia, okay? So the, the, uh, the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is a, 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 a form of a gene called APOE4, that's called APOE, sorry, APOE, that's called APOE epsilon four. And if you have one or two copies of that gene, there's a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, but you're not doomed to get it, okay? But there's definitely a higher risk. And studies, including those that we conduct here at Columbia, have shown that, that if you have those genes, you have, you're more likely to have high levels of amyloid in the brain, okay? Uh, by the way, not everybody who has amyloid in the brain gets dementia, okay? So that's, that's an important thing to point out. There's people walking out there with high amyloid in the brain who are cognitively normal or have very mild impairment and do not get dementia. So that's important to point out. Not even the amyloid dooms you to have uh, the, the, to get dementia, okay? Now there's other, many other genes that have been identified as important but none of them carries the weight of APOE4. So APOE4, so APOE in the epsilon four form, uh, you know, it the 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 proportion of the population that has this uh, high risk gene varies from population to population. But I think it's fair to say that uh, in the United States is between 20 and 30% of the population has this gene. So you could say it's, it's actually a fairly high proportion, but people who have Alzheimer's dementia, about 
50% uh, have this gene, okay? Um, so so it's a, it has a very strong effect, this gene. Now there's many other genes that have smaller increases in risk and are only carried by very small proportions of the population. So uh, there's huge research going on about this. There's an investigator here at Columbia called Richard Mayhew who leads a, ma a major uh, genetics and Alzheimer's disease consortium. So he's carrying out a lot of studies, you know, trying to discover these other genes, you know, and how they, they affect the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, now, there's, there's no, you, you may see that or read that there's commercial services that offer getting tested for, the, for this gene, the, the, this form of the gene, APOE4. But the bottom line is, is that physicians don't do this. We don't do this on a routine basis. You know, it's not like measuring your cholesterol and then we're gonna put you on a cholesterol medication. We don't do this with APOE4. And, and the main reason is because as I said before, you know, this doesn't mean that you're doomed to get Alzheimer's disease. And because actually there's a dearth of treatments for Alzheimer's disease, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that, okay? But the reason why I'm saying this is because after this talk, you may go in and Google APOE4 and you may find something that says, you know, we, we will test your APOE4 uh, for X amount of money. Uh, so I just wanna say that that's not standard of care. We don't do that clinically. Uh, if you do that, you know, it's, it, it's, I guess you can do it out of curiosity, but then I'm not sure that you're going to do anything with that information. So I personally would not recommend that, that people uh, do that. Okay. So uh, whether that's going to change in the future, I don't know, but that's the state of things uh, nowadays. So what are the other big risk, risk factors? for dementia and Alzheimer's disease in particular. Well, for vascular dementia is very easy, okay? Because it, they're related to strokes. And so it's the risk factors for strokes. So it's high blood pressure is a very big one, huge risk factor for, for stroke and for vascular dementia. But also things like diabetes, uh, you know, high cholesterol, uh, which, by the way, are usually accompanied by high blood pressure, you know, are, are definitely important. So, you know, those are things that can be prevented and, or can be treated if they're not prevented and I think can have a huge impact on, on the risk of vascular dementia. Now, if for Alzheimer's disease and all other dementias, I mean, age is a very big one. Uh, the older you are, the higher the risk, but there's nothing that we can do about age, uh, at least not yet. Uh, although there's huge, uh, there's huge uh, interest in looking at mechanisms of senescence in relation to Alzheimer's disease. In other words, looking at what causes aging and the mechanisms that cause aging, how they actually also increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. There's huge interest in that area. Uh, it, you know, people with higher education tend to have a lower risk of manifesting Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general. And it's thought that the mechanism for this is that uh, people with higher education have more uh, connections in the nerve cells. And so they're able to better withstand, withstand injury. Injury in this case means, you know, the bad proteins in the brain and the stroke. And so, uh, so they have more reserve, uh, but but of course, if you get enough damage, it doesn't matter how many nerve connections you have, then at some point, you know, that's gonna take you over the edge. And, you know, education, I guess we can do something about on a public health and societal level, but at an individual level, you know, if you're at a, you know, at a certain point in your life, you know, it doesn't mean that going out and trying to get a PhD is gonna get you, uh, it's gonna lower your risk of dementia, but. Certainly, it is thought that you know uh, being socially engaged and 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 exercising your mind uh, is definitely a good thing. Uh, and you may have read uh, about this. So, what are the other things that we can act on to to prevent uh, 
dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease in particular, well, there's, there's an increasing consensus that the things that I mentioned for vascular dementia also help for Alzheimer's disease, okay? And it's probably because, uh, you know, if you have a healthier brain from a vascular standpoint, then, you know, you need a much higher level of amyloid to give you the dementia, okay? And whether high blood pressure and diabetes is or, and high cholesterol are related to amyloid, th that's controversial. And actually a lot of the research that I do is, is, is trying to determine whether things like diabetes increase the amyloid in the brain or not, or whether it's all the, the strokes and, and things of that sort or other mechanisms that we don't know about. But definitely, I think a, a good motto to have is, is that things that lead to a healthy heart uh, lead to a healthy brain. And, uh, you know, and I think that's a good way to think about it. So all the things that we hear that are important to, uh, to take care of your heart, which is having, you know, having a healthy way through a, a good diet and physical activity, you know, trying to prevent uh, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, uh, high cholesterol, and heart disease in general. If and if if you can't prevent them, to then treat them appropriately. I mean, fortunately, we're living in an era where there's very good treatment for all of these things. There's really almost no excuse to not have a well-controlled blood pressure, not have a well-controlled uh, 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 cholesterol. And you know, diabetes may be a little bit harder to control, but actually it's, there's, there's many resources to have well-controlled diabetes nowadays. So definitely those things uh, seem to, uh, to help, although it's not totally proven. Uh, you know, one, one of the uh, phenomena, that phenomena uh, that has been observed uh, by, by several investigators already is that actually, the, the, rate, the rates of dementia, meaning how many, how many cases of dementia you have per 100 or 1,000 people have been decreasing, has been decreasing over the last few decades. What happens is that the numbers of people with dementia are increasing because the population is getting larger and particularly because the, the proportion of the population that's aged 70 plus, 80 plus is increasing as, as, a, as a, so so the absolute number of cases of dementia are increasing, but actually the number of cases of dementia per a hundred people or a thousand people, whatever you choose, it has been decreasing over the decades. And uh, there's many people interested in, you know, what explains this phenomenon. And uh, it's definitely uh, not, a bias in diagnosis because if anything, dementia is diagnosed more now than before. So actually, when you think about it, that now dementia is diagnosed more than before, the fact that the numbers have been decreasing means actually that the decrease is maybe even greater than we appreciate in research studies. Uh, I hope that that's not too confusing. Uh, but definitely what has, pa the, the parallel to that has been the improvement in heart health and in the treatment of heart disease and in the prevention of stroke, which has been dramatic over the last 40 years. Um, and, uh, and I would say the last 30 years in particular. And there are studies that have tried to look at this. For example, there's a study from uh, Ontario, Canada showing that the, the levels of dementia uh, the, the rates of dementia decreased at the same time that the rates of stroke decreased. And again, when I say rate, I'm not talking about absolute numbers. I'm talking about the number of cases, the proportions, the number of cases per 100 or 1,000 people in the population. Now, I think you're, you're never going to be able to prove this because that's, that's what, it's, it's what's called an ecological study, which means, you know, in a certain area, there's been a decrease in strokes and an improvement in heart health. And at the same time, there's been a decrease in, in dementia, but it's hard to connect those two 
at the individual level. In other words, we don't know if the individuals who had the decreased risk of stroke also had the decreased risk of dementia. And since you know we we can't go back and do a study all over again, you know, uh, you know, look at the population all over again. I, I think we're never going to have an answer to this. But I think that I would speculate strongly that that is true. Okay, that actually we are seeing improvements overall in the risk of dementia because overall the health of the population is better and particularly the cardiovascular, meaning the heart health and the brain health of the population. So to me, I think that's very encouraging in terms of, you know, giving support to the, to the notion that taking care of yourself from all these practices that we hear about, you know, that are good for your heart will, will help uh, the risk of dementia and, and, and the, the, the brain health in, partic in particular. So, so another, so anyhow, a lot of the research that I do actually is in uh, trying to improve uh, with approaches with heart health and things like that. And, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about later about a, a particular uh, clinical trial that we're conducting at Columbia uh, using a drug that you may be familiar with, which is called metformin, which is a drug that's for diabetes, but also has good effects on inflammation, on cholesterol, and, and other things. And, and that's why, we're, why we're, we're testing to see if it works. Uh, now, another thing that that people ask, uh, the public asks a lot is about supplements and whether supplements help or not. And, you know, my, my answer to that is that uh, most studies or the, the great majority of studies have not shown a benefit of any kinds of supplements, okay? Uh, so, uh, for example, Vitamin E, most of the studies have shown no benefit. And actually there's, a, there's some studies suggesting that taking high doses of vitamin E may actually increase the risk of death. So I think you have to be careful with that. No, 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 you don't wanna go, you don't wanna understand So uh, um, uh, there's, there's other vitamins such as vitamin B12 that have been tested. And uh, in terms of vitamin B12, what I say is that it, it's vitamin B12 deficiency is very common in the population, okay? Particularly above a certain age. And the reason for this is that uh, with age, there's, there's a condition called atrophic gastritis, which means that there's, there's uh, atrophy of the lining of the stomach, which is necessary to absorb vitamin B12. So actually, I'm a general internist and as a physician, you always have to have this in the back of your mind because it can manifest as, as a neuropathy. Uh, uh, it can manifest with abnormalities in the blood. And so you test for this. And so if somebody has low B12 levels, yeah, they absolutely mm -hmm. should receive supplements for B12, uh, probably for life. But I would say that if you have normal B12 levels, uh, you know, taking additional B12, I don't think there's proof that that helps, okay? And the same thing for folate, okay? There are studies that have shown that there might be a benefit, but it's not clear to me that those that actually had low levels in blood were, were, take, were distinguished from those who didn't, okay? And, and again, I wanna warn everybody that the assumption that vitamins are harmless may not be completely true, okay? Uh, there are studies of vitamin C in smokers, for example, that showed that supplementation with vitamin C actually increased the risk of lung cancer, okay? Now, why these things happen, I have my ideas about it, but, I, but they're speculative, so I'd rather not go into it, but I would be very careful with the assumption that uh, taking vitamins uh, is, is necessarily harmless, okay? Uh, people ask me a lot about omega-3, uh, which are very popular. So I have to say, you know, if, if there's some suggestive evidence, although it's not widespread and it's not hugely strong, 
of, of something that might help is omega-3s. So if you tell me I take omega-3s, I'll probably tell you, you know, well, I, it's okay, that's, that's your choice. Uh, you know, I, I think it's okay if you do that. Uh, the problem with supplements in general is that they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And so you have to trust the manufacturer and the reputation of the manufacturer that they're actually giving you what they say they're giving you. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're not regulated as, for example, when you're when you take a, a brand cholesterol drug. By the way, I'm 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 not getting paid by by any pharmaceutical company to to say this. I have no conflicts of interest in this regard, but there is there isn't the same type of of uh, regulation. And and if you look at you know uh, I was looking at a supplement uh, ad over the weekend. You know the way they sell these things. They say, well, this is the brand most preferred by doctors. You know and you know, I don't, I mean, it's a very vague, it's a very vague uh, statement. Uh, I mean, you, you, there will be physicians who based on knowledge that they have, they may have their preferred supplement uh, uh, manufacturers for things like omega-3s and, and, you know, I guess you, you can trust them. Uh, there's things like vitamin D that get talked about. Uh, you know, vitamin D deficiency is actually very, very common. Insufficiency or deficiency is very common uh, in, in the Northeast uh, because, you know, we have six months of cold weather where we're barely uh, exposed to the sun. You know, sun exposure is necessary for vitamin D. And, uh, and then most of the year, even when it's sunny, you know, we're fully covered and, you know, we, we sell them go out and we're avoiding to get sunburns, et cetera. So, so I think it's a good idea to be, to be screened for vitamin D uh, levels. Uh, that's something that a doctor can do. And, uh, you know, and, and if it, uh, there's two levels of, of deficiency, if you will, there's, there's a mild, a milder form of, that's called insufficiency. And, and, you know, you've given pills at a certain dose and, the, and there's a more severe form where you're given much higher doses of vitamin D. And, and it's important to get tested and, and see what the levels are because vitamin D at very high levels can be toxic. So you have to be careful uh, when you take these things. So, uh, you know, a multivitamin, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that it helps, you know, I'm on the fence uh, for of that, uh, I mean, you know, I personally don't take a, a multivitamin. I mean, if I had a deficiency that I knew about, I would supplement that particular deficiency. But other than that, you know, I just try to eat a balanced meal, uh, uh, things like that. So, um, all right. So how, how about actual treatment of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in general? So, so I, I would say that there's two types of treatments. You know, one is symptomatic treatment. Symptomatic meaning that it alleviates symptoms, but it doesn't change uh, the disease. So, you know, it's like taking, uh, you know, acetaminophen or Tylenol for a cold. Uh, the Tylenol is not, you know, it's helping you while you get through the cold, but it's actually doing nothing to the viruses that cause the cold or anything. Okay? It just makes you feel better. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's two broad, broad classes of, uh, of medications uh, in this category. One is called the cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, there's several that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, I can't remember all of them right now, but there's galantamine, there's donepacil, donepacil is Aricept, uh, galantamine, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not remembering right now the, the, uh, the commercial name. And there's, uh, there's one or two more that are approved by the, by the FDA. And they are indicated for people who already have a diagnosis of dementia, okay? From mild to severe uh, uh, stages of dementia. And in mild stages, it may and you know, may is the important word here. It may help with you know forgetfulness and attention, and, and and that type of symptom. 
in more severe stages, it actually helps with agitation, you know, and in, 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 uh, with uh, behavioral symptoms. And it has side effects. These medications have side effects, particularly, uh, you know, gastrointestinal, you know, stomach upset and things like that. So I personally, what I do is, you know, I start people in these medications and I, I increase the dose or maintain them if people can, can, can tolerate them. Uh, and then, you know, I ask the caregivers in particular, whether they know it or, or the person, whether they notice an improvement. And if they do, you know, I keep them on the medication, but if they notice no improvement, if they're not helping or they're causing side effects, then I, I don't, uh, I don't use them. So the other kind of, uh, the other uh, treatment is memantine, uh, which is used in severe Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I don't know if the indication has been extended also to moderate Alzheimer's disease, but anyhow, it's not for mild stages of Alzheimer's disease uh, or dementia. And, uh, and there's also a preparation that's a combination of the donepacil, a cholinesterase inhibitor with the memantine. So it's, it, which is approved by the FDA for use in severe, in severe dementia. But again, these are symptomatic treatments that are, are, are used to improve uh, you know, behavioral symptoms, agitation and things like that, and also cognitive symptoms, meaning you know, uh, forgetfulness. Now, how about, how about treatments that actually uh, target the biology of, of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general? So for, for a couple of decades at least now, or maybe a little less, there's been uh, treatments that have been developed that target this bad protein amyloid, okay? Uh, the great majority of clinical trials for treatments that target amyloid have not worked out. There's, in September, there was a lot of press for one agent from, I believe the company Biogen that, uh, that had significant uh, results, meaning, meaning that from the standpoint of of the criteria that we investigators use to judge whether something has an effect or not, it met that criteria. I have not been able to see the data myself. Actually, in two weeks, uh, there's going to be a major Alzheimer's meeting in um, uh, San Francisco where the, the company and the investigators will be presenting the results of these, this study and other studies. And we will be able to assess really whether this is a major effect or it's a small effect, because the fact that something is has a significant effect from a statistical standpoint doesn't mean that it's going to be hugely impactful. Okay. Uh, however, it's an advance. It's definitely an improvement on the way that things have been, but I'm not sure that it's going to revolutionize the treatment for Alzheimer's disease just yet, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my breath and, and I'm holding judgment and personally until I see more data, but it seems to be a, a good step forward, uh, a good step forward um, uh, in the future. Actually, I just saw today, uh, I got an email of a report of another clinical trial of a similar agent that was reported today and that one had no effect, okay? So, so we have a little bit of good news, uh, but mostly not positive news, uh, but you know, I'll have more to say after I go to this meeting and speak with experts and hear actually the formal showing of the data of the clinical trial, which I haven't had a chance uh, to see myself. Um, so there's, so, so I would say that uh, you, you may have heard of this other treatment called aducanumab. Uh, uh, aduhelm is the name of the drug that actually there were controversial findings for it uh, earlier in the year and last year. 
uh, because one trial showed a, a, a no effect, another trial showed a potential effect, and they had stopped the trial early. So there's a lot of con controversy about this. And the FDA uh, provided uh, a temporary or, or a conditional approval for the drug against the advice of most people in the committee, okay? So, uh, so that has been very, very controversial. And now there's new clinical trials of the same agent to see if it's effective or not, which is the right thing to do. You know, when you get controversial data in one or two clinical trials, the right thing to do is to repeat the trial all over again, conduct it in the right way and see what the results are. Because, you know, we're all, I have gotten burned in my career thinking that something was effective based on faulty data and on wrong assumptions. And then, you know, when you do a, another study, it doesn't pan out. So I think the right thing to do is to wait for the other clinical trial. But of course, you know, for thing for people who are desperate, who are seeking some kind of treatment, you know, that it's easier for me to say what I'm saying, but I can understand the the uh, the uh, the viewpoint of people who want to be treated because they have no hope other than than those potential treatments. So that there are there there are um, opportunities for participating in clinical trials of these kinds of agents. Uh, and in particular, for the for the clinical trial of the Aduhelm of the Adakanumab, which was uh, conditionally approved by the FDA, and actually Medicare is paying for it as long as it's given as part of a clinical trial, but it's not paying for it in in clinical practice. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of treatment, what I can say for sure is that we know more now than we knew ten years ago and five years ago. And I think in, in just a few years, we're gonna know much more than we know now. There's proposals for other types of targets that, that could be treated. I think we have to see, we have to wait and see what happens. By the way, the other thing about these treatments is that, is that they have side effects, things that can happen in your brain, for example, and they're, they're incredibly expensive, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, if not, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So. So it's so, you know, they're, they're, it's it's controversial at the moment. But let's see what happens towards the end of the year with the report of this other uh, treatment uh, that that has received a lot of press and that uh, of being effective. Let let's see, let's see when when the data comes through when it when it goes through the FDA approval process what other information comes out, it may turn out that it's really, really good, uh, but I, I just don't have enough information myself uh, at the moment to, to talk more about it. So, uh, so anyhow, the, the, the fact that, that uh, dementia in general and Alzheimer's disease is, is so prevalent and that we, we lack uh, effective treatments, or let me put it this way, what, what, what what the field of Alzheimer's disease is trying to do is trying to move into where, uh, uh, into where uh, cardiology, cardiovascular disease has gone, which is to have very effective treatments uh, in the last, I mean, I've, I've, I've been a physician for 30 years and what I have seen in, in uh, cardiovascular disease has just been revolutionary. Uh, the same thing can be said for cancer. I mean, cancer just in the last five or 10 years, it's just talked about in a completely different realm than it was 20 years ago. I mean, cancer is not as scary a word nowadays. It is scary, but there's, there's incredibly more hope nowadays, not for all cancers, but for many cancers compared to 10 years ago. So Alzheimer's disease, is not the field of Alzheimer's disease and dementia is not there yet, but that, that's where we're trying to go. You know, we're trying to be as successful as, uh, as cardiovascular, uh, this cardiovascular disease field and the cancer field have become in terms of prevention and treatment. And, you know, I think we're gonna get there, but it's, it's, it's a complex, uh, uh, what we call Alzheimer's disease and uh, Alzheimer's disease related dementias is a complex set of diseases that are not, 
you know, whereas, for example, cancers are, you know, very well defined. They're caused by several, several things. You know, you can clearly identify, you know, what they are and how they ought to be targeted. So we don't, we don't, uh, the, it's not as clear yet in Alzheimer's disease, but that's where we're trying uh, to get. So anyhow, a, a consequence, of course, of, uh, of, of this reality is that although, as I said before, the rates of dementia are decreasing, again, what that means is that the number of cases per 100 or per 1,000 people in the population are decreasing for dementia, which is a very, uh, it's, it's a success and it's very hopeful. The bottom line is that the numbers are increasing because all of us are aging uh, and, and we're probably gonna live into, into, our, in, into our 80s and 90s. And so, and so there's a higher risk, there's gonna be more people with dementia because of that. So, so you know, that leads, of course, to the problem of caregiving, uh, which is what, you know, Dante is a specialist in and what, what caring kind uh, uh, addresses for the most part. And so uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that, that uh, caring kind, uh, you know, conducts in this arena and, and I've been a big supporter of it. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Dante, if at some point you want to speak farther about your programs, et cetera. But uh, uh, we are very fortunate because in New York State, there, there's a well-supported uh, Alzheimer's program uh, that's statewide that uh, I think supports not just Caring Kind's programs, but other programs as well. Um, and you know, I hope that those those programs uh, continue. So before before I I, I give the the uh, uh, I let Dan to speak, and before I start the the question and answer sessions, I just want to say so here at Columbia in the Department of Neurology, there's many ongoing clinical trials that can be searched through the Department of Neurology website. I particularly in our shop, we have one clinical trial of the drug metformin which is a drug uh, that's one of the reasons why I test it is because it's very safe. Uh, actually, it recently, uh, uh, it was the, the hundredth anniversary of metformin. It's been around for, for a hundred years. It's a, it's a first line drug for diabetes, but uh, uh, we're testing it in people without diabetes uh, because it doesn't cause you know, uh, unhealthy drops in, glu in sugar. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually been uh, uh, hypothesized to help in cancer and in aging in general. So we're testing it for the prevention of dementia in people who already have some cognitive complaints. So that's one program that we have ongoing that is funded by the National Institute on Aging. And you know, Sam Kamek, who's on, on, the, on the call, uh, he, he can provide uh, more information about it if any of you were interested uh, for yourselves or for others. And, and sometime in the spring next year, we will be conducting a clinical trial of a, uh, <clears throat> of, of a, of a uh, I don't want to call it a supplement, but it is a supplement uh, that increases levels of thiamine. Thiamine is, is vitamin B1 uh, in people who already are known to have Alzheimer's disease. And, and that will, will start uh, sometime in the spring uh, uh, next year. So, uh, so Dante, why don't I pass it on yeah. to you and then I'll, we'll, we can be open for questions and answers. Thank you so much for that, all of that great information, Dr. Lushenko. And if anybody wants more information about the research part at Columbia, who, how, how do they get in contact? Yeah, so, so Sam, I think, sent a message. Uh, okay. But, but of course, you know, you can also Google me okay. at, uh, in the Columbia website. You, you can get my email and you can, you can, uh, you can certainly uh, uh, contact me directly about it. Uh, but you know, Sam uh, is providing some of the contact information. And, okay, and thank you, Sam. Uh, so we do have um, a lot of conversation in the chat. So we could start with some uh, qu um, question that uh, that came up. 
Uh, so Jenny uh, said, my dad has vascular dementia and recently was diagnosed with beginnings of muscular degeneration in his right eye. He is, be, he is receiving injections in that eye for the last four months and noticed that he's sharper now. Is that normal? Can dementia be worsened by vision and improvement when pressure behind the eye decreases? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so I think there's there's two. So so I would say that there's three possibilities here. One that this is a ch just a chance observation, uh, meaning that it that there's no connection between the two. The other one is that indeed improvements in vision somehow uh, result in improvement in. Um, in um, uh, you know, in cognition uh, and behavior, uh, the other one is that maybe the drug itself uh, could be having some effect. And actually, uh, you know, macular degeneration used to be untreatable and an important cause of blindness in in the elderly. And now there there are these you know miraculous treatments. You know, it's it's really incredible. And actually people who have macular degeneration, they will report to you that they have cloudy vision. And, and upon getting this injection, I mean, within a very short time, you know, hours to days, they, their, their vision improves. So there's huge interest in the effect of sensory impairments in dementia. Uh, so I actually conduct research with a young uh, uh, ENT specialist called Justin Golub, who is actually about to start a clinical trial in which he's gonna test hearing aids for the prevention of cognitive decline. Um, so, you know, in this particular, about this particular question, you know, I cannot tell you for sure what's happened, but there's no doubt that I think sensory deprivation and particularly hearing and vision does not help uh, cognitive performance. So if you can improve the vision and you can improve the hearing impairment, potentially you, you can potentially something that needs to be tested can improve uh, the, the cognition. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I actually, I mean, I'm going to say something that ha sounds funny, but it's not. And I, I hope that it doesn't come across the wrong way. So, so I have a dog who, who's 13 years old. Uh, he's a, a Shih Tzu and, uh, and he's gotten very, very old. And uh, when, and I don't know if you know, but Shih Tzus develop, you know, very long hair. And, and uh, so the hair covers the ears and covers the eyes. And actually, when we when we cut the hair of the dog, the dog perks up uh, and starts, you know, listening to us. And 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 actually, uh, we've noticed we've wondered whether the dog is demented. But when we cut the hair, we it improves. So I actually told my wife, like you know, I I think that uh, actually uh, the sense the dog sensory deprivation is actually, you know, interacting with, of course, you know, what's probably some kind of mild dementia and, and, uh, and it's worsening uh, the dog's behavior. And it's actually pretty, a pretty incredible, um, a pretty incredible effect. So anyhow, yes, I, I, do, I do believe, but, but there's research to prove this, that sensory deprivation uh, has a role in, in the cognitive impairment uh, and, and dementia in general. Yeah, so, so Elizabeth, before Elizabeth um, signed out, she did say that there, that there was, she's heard of some type of connection between hearing loss, um, vision, um, and all these senses that if someone has hearing problems or visual problems, um, you know, addressing that can, help other symptoms maybe can be behavioral um cognitive you know not, not so sure but definitely if there's a behavior issue with that that could be something that can be explored uh, there's another question uh, dr lucinger uh, i uh, so the question is from um jenny uh um, and you said that you accompany your accompany your doctor 
to all the doctor appointments. And the question is pretty much about the medical staff and how they interact with patients with dementia. So are they trained to, is the medical staff trained to interact with patients with dementia and their families? Yeah, so this is very challenging. Uh, I actually, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm the, the chief of a section of geriatrics, gerontology and aging uh, here at Columbia that's just starting. And this is one of the things that I want to uh, tackle. You know the the chat. You know I'm a primary care physician, and and it it it's a very challenging role because basically you have 15, 20 minutes uh, to look at uh, numerous uh, medical problems, uh, all of which require your attention. You know arthritis, depression, diabetes, hypertension, and in addition to that, you know. You have to write your note, you have to address social issues, you have to address paperwork, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that uh, on one side, I think you have to improve awareness of dementia and how to, how to treat people with cognitive impairment. But I think uh, on the other side is you have to create teams uh, that, that can deal with this from a, um, in a comprehensive standpoint. And something that I, I, for many years, have been trying to do, but I, 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 I've gotten to it, but in baby steps is to create medical homes for people with, uh, with dementia and their families. Uh, you know, in medical homes, what that means uh, from a conceptually is that there's a, there's a, a one-stop shopping where you, you get every, all your care. Uh, and all the services. In other words, you get, you know, the the primary care physician, the social worker, the psychologist, et cetera. And, and that includes support for the caregivers and the families as well. And so that's what I would like to see happen. Actually, my the work that I did with Dante was taking just a little piece of that and uh, and and trying to develop it to, to, to then integrate it all. But I think that's what's going to be necessary in the long term, particularly because, you know, I think that uh, living with people with dementia is a reality. And, you know, there's a movement about, uh, you know, dementia friendly cities, for example. So I think we have to have, you know, dementia friendly clinical practices as well. But, you know, that, that's going to take some work. OK, uh, there, there's a, another question about a connection between long-term migraine syndrome as a young person and future dementia? Yeah, well, I hope not because I've had migraines since I was like eight years old and, uh, and I'm, a, I'm a frequent migraineur. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's been studies published on this. I actually think that I read a headline recently, but I just don't remember. You know, the, the, I guess... Potentially there is, uh, because uh, what migraine is, is really a vascular problem in the end. It's, it's a, a problem of abnormal vascular contraction and, uh, and dilatation and impaired blood flow to the brain. That's what it is. And actually, when I, when I get uh, migraines, I have to check out because I, I start, you know, saying things that I shouldn't say. I, I name people the wrong way. I actually, last week I had a migraine and somebody came back to me and said, you know, you named me by the wrong name. And that was not my mother's given name. And I had to apologize. I had to say, well, I'm sorry. I had a migraine and I, I become cognitively impaired. So my guess is that if one gets, you know, very severe migraines, and particularly if there's evidence of vascular disease in the brain of infarcts, and there's, there's, there's migraine, there's, there's studies that have shown that people with migraines have more vascular disease. I mean, again, that's, this is feasible. This is plausible. Um, but I, I, it's, it's, it's educated speculation on my part right now. I don't know that there's that many studies that have looked at this to, to be able to establish this uh, definitively. Okay. Next question comes from Michelle. Uh, what type of doctors qualify to make a dementia diagnosis? 
Yeah, so, you know, I think any doctor can make a diagnosis of moderate to severe dementia, okay, because it's very obvious. Um, now, uh, the, in, in cases of, of mild dementia, I think ideally uh, this should be done by a cognitive specialist, which in most settings, it's either a neurologist or a psychiatrist or a geriatrician that has particular training and that is supported by a team that uh, includes usually a neuropsychologist who conducts you know, particular uh, very detailed uh, cognitive testing. So, uh, you know, one of the projects that we have, although we're close to enrollment, is, is a project in which we're comparing side to side uh, different modalities to, to detect dementia uh, early, uh, to identify who needs to go for a more detailed uh, workup and who doesn't, okay? So this is a very challenging issue. But anyhow, going, I think at, at Columbia, we're, we're uh, we're, we're fortunate because um, we have a, a wealth of, uh, of uh, resources, particularly in, um, uh, in neurology. And uh, if you Google uh, the, the following, uh, you will find that New York State has what's called the, uh, a, a network of centers of excellence in Alzheimer's disease. CEADs, uh, they are uh, funded by the New York State Department of Health and their uh, single mission is to help with the via referral resource for the evaluation of, uh, of cognitive disorders for people who have concerns, okay? And so uh, in New York, uh, there's three that I, in New York City, there's three that I know about. There's one at, a, at New York University, I believe. There's one here at Columbia. There's one at SUNY Downstate. There may, I think there's one in Westchester County as well. Uh, there's, 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 there's more than double digit centers in yeah. New York State. Uh, if anybody's interested, we do have the complete list. Okay, thanks. Canada. Thanks, Dante. So, mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and by the way, related to this, there's caregiving centers of excellence as well that, uh, that I'm sure in programs that, that I'm sure Caring Kind is affiliated mm -hmm. with. But, uh, but you know, so, so I would say that from a public access standpoint, very open access, there's the Centers of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease. They're already paid to do this. You know, they're not gonna bill you. Uh, and, and uh, but then, you know, uh, uh, I mean, in New York City, we're fortunate because we have, uh, I think one thing that distinguishes New York City from other cities in the country is that we have, I mean, just in Manhattan, you have four or five, you know, major uh, medical centers. I would say you have many more secondary medical centers. And so there's a network of uh, specialty care that one way or another should give uh, people access to, to proper assessments. Uh, but anyhow, anyhow the, the Centers of Excellence of Alzheimer's Disease are, are a good start uh, for people who don't have access to, to, to uh, these medical centers in New York City. And th th there was a follow-up question to what, what is the accepted process of diagnosis, especially in a nursing home environment? Yeah, in a nursing home environment, well, uh, you know, I, I, I get, my guess is that in a nursing home, uh, you're likely to find not mild cases, you know, unless somebody's in a nursing home for, for something that's not cognitive, but it's completely physical. But, you know, you can start with a cognitive screener, uh, you know, something like the mini mental status exam, uh, or there's the mini cog, there's different types of screeners that are accessible to, to, uh, um, to most physicians in a nursing home and to most personnel in a nursing home, actually even nurses. And then, you know, if, if there's doubt as to whether the cognitive impairment is of enough severity to affect, you know, function, which again is the definition of dementia, as I said at the very beginning, 
then I think you, uh, a specialist should be brought in. But but uh, but definitely, um, you know, uh, I think moderate to severe cases. Uh, if you can make the case as a clinician that there's cognitive impairment of of uh, enough of a certain severity and that it is that cognitive impairment that does not allow the person to live independently from a cognitive standpoint that's that's basically the that that's the narrative that you need to have in order to say that someone has dementia okay now if you cannot make that for sure then then that's where you know getting a specialist is, is appropriate uh, also, if you're di if somebody's diagnosed with dementia and they want to know if they have amyloid in the brain or don't don't have amyloid, and then want to you know do this so that they can be included in clinical trials or or that are targeting that amyloid, then definitely that there should be a referral as well. Next question is from Helen. Uh, what uh, what to do with vitamin B twelve deficiency? please restate whether B12 supplement is possibly helpful or proven to have no effect. Pale no, no, I mean, I, if, if there is deficiency, absolutely, it has to be, it has to be uh, replaced because it is well known that uh, vitamin B12 deficiency causes uh, anemia, okay? It causes hematologic abnormalities. Mm -hmm but also causes neurologic abnormality. So it causes what's called, you know, neuropathy, which is you get, you know, uh, tingles and, uh, in, 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 you know, your nerves and in, in particular in your feet, but also it could be in your hands uh, that, you know, they can become numb uh, and the damage can be permanent if you don't treat it, but it can also cause permanent uh, damage in the brain. And actually, you know, in the, not in the modern era, but you know, I guess uh, in the 19th century and, and early 20th century, vitamin B12 deficiency was a cause of dementia, okay? Because it, it wasn't treated. So now it's much less common because uh, uh, you know, food is fortified, you know, bread is fortified with folate and, and other things that are related. Nonetheless, B12 deficiency is not uncommon. I would say that it's a common problem. And so uh, it's tested by primary care physicians all the time. And if there's B12 deficiency, it's actually very likely that the cause is this atrophic gastritis, uh, which is irreversible. And given that that's the case, it's very likely that uh, supplements will be needed for life, okay? Uh, and sometimes the supplements can be by mouth that, you know, you give very high doses of vitamin B12 levels and they can overcome the lack of absor absor absorption in the gut. But I personally, most of the time, just give it injected, okay? Uh, monthly or every few months. Uh, and that's what I do, okay? And people come, you know, they have their vaccinate, like a vaccination card and they come in and they get injected with vitamin B12. So, no, absolutely. I, I don't want to be ambiguous about this. If if there is documented B12 deficiency, uh, uh, you know, uh, replacing that that uh, missing B12 is a must. Next question is: Can medical marijuana help those with dementia, Alzheimer's, in any way? I have no idea. I really don't. I mean, I can imagine how it could help with some behavioral issues and people who are very agitated, but I, I have to confess that personally, I don't have experience. My guess is that there are studies ongoing, but I'm just not familiar with it. I would have to educate myself about that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh... I think that's it. The, does anybody else have any questions? Well, if there's no questions, you know, I, I thank you all for, for listening and, and for the great questions. I mean, that question about the, about the uh, uh, treatment for macular degeneration, I'm actually going to look into whether 
the actual injections <laughs> can mm -hmm. potentially uh, because you know it's it's an injection that not only affects the vision but it affects the immune system and inflammation and things like that. So I'm actually going to look into that. It's a monoclonal antibody. So uh, I'll 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 that that's a very interesting question and it wouldn't have occurred to me if if I hadn't if it, if the question hadn't been uh, uh, posed today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lucinda, for your time and for the rich information you gave us. Uh, if anybody, if nobody else has any questions, we're going to end. Dante, and... I want to interrupt you really quickly. Hi, everybody. Sure. I'm Sam. I work with Dr. Lutzinger. Um, if you do have any questions about, you know, the MAP study or any of the work that we're doing here uh, that Dr. Lutzinger is doing, feel free to email me. And my email address is ac. 2239 at columbia.edu. And remember that C O L U M B I A. We're not a country in South America. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and if anybody wants, you know, this is recorded. So if anybody wants a copy of this, just feel free. I'm, I'm putting the email, our email in the chat. Uh, it's helpline at caring kind nyc.org. You can also uh, call the helpline and I'll also put that number um, on the chat. Uh, and um, if you have no other questions, we'll end. Okay. Uh, happy Thank Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Everybody. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was very informative. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. You guys take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.